my name's Laura. Um, that was a really great intro. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, I'm a UX consultant at a place called Experience UX. Um, I'm based on the south coast in Bournemouth. Um, and we bring back a lot of research from the clients we work with. Um, loads and loads of it. So we've been really interested lately in uh, how we can use stories and storytelling um, to sort of get that across to our clients, what we've found, our findings and our insights. Um, so I'm really excited to share with you today um, what our findings were. So I have this unhealthy interest with storytelling. <laughs> it's just a, a passion of mine. Um, uh, but also, it's just one of the oldest and most universal forms of communication that we have as humans. Um, and we respond really well to them as well. We re respond really well to stories, and we've told them for a long time. Um, but I want to sort of explore what goes on, on in our heads when we're telling stories to one another, a bit like we are today. Um, and I want to show you why the hell it's linked to UX as well, and why it's a useful skill to have. Um, Mainly, there are just so many parallels with storytelling and creating experiences. So um, in stories, we have things like uh, characters and plots and settings. Um, but we kind of have this sort of thing in user experience as well. We've got people, we've got context, um, you know, all those sort of things that cross over like uh, journeys, user journeys as well. And aren't all user experiences just great stories, really? Um, you know, and if you can tell a great story, you can create a great experience as well. Um, so think about you know, the emerging technology we're seeing as well um, that we've heard about today from Alexandra and we're going to hear about next as well. Um, Storytelling is going to be a key part of that as well. It's going to be really um, a key element when we're creating these new worlds and immersive experiences. And not only that, you can sort of tell stories about your user research that you found as well to your stakeholders and the people in your business and, and uh, your clients. And it's Carmine Gallo, he puts it a bit more succinctly than I ever can, uh, that one emotional and vivid customer story is far more persuasive than a data dump in 85 PowerPoint slides. Um, so I haven't got 85 PowerPoint slides, I've got 40, so that's good. Um, and he's an American broadcast journalist, he really knows what he's talking about. Um, but what his point is, is that you can have these great ideas, um, but if you can't inspire other people to buy into those ideas, it doesn't matter, you're screwed, really. So, <laughs> really insightful words there. Uh, so it only seems right, given the subject, uh, that I start by telling you a really short personal story about my childhood. Um, and it's going to demonstrate some of the things that I want to talk about later on in this talk. So there's a few things you need to know first about me, is that I had um, a fairly normal childhood, a uh, fairly run-of-the-mill, nothing unusual there. Um, and I wasn't a bad child, really. Um, I just had a real problem with being good. <laughs> so, uh, and following rules and not setting fire to things. So I had quite, quite a problem with doing those sort of things. Um, my mum affectionately referred to me as a devil as well. <laughs> and. It was so bad, I've kind of had to chart this out for you because um, these are all real things that happened in my childhood um, because of what I was doing. So um, this is my ascent or descent, really, into delinquency. And if you project this out uh, into, like, when I'm maybe 60 or so, um, I'm kind of some kind of intergalactic overlord or something, you know, like Darth Vader. So uh, lucky for you, I've plateaued out. I'm a normal functioning member of society these days. Um, I'm not setting fire to anything anymore. Um, so yeah, the sort of starts off as a normal you know, thing, banned from a few toddler groups because I hit a few babies on the head. And um, then there's that sustained period of setting fire to things um, that I was talking about, and then dancing around them, which was fun. Um, so I've censored some of the things in my, you know, teens, as I get towards my teens, um, just my own dignity, and I, if you catch me later, maybe I will tell you some of those things. Um, just don't give me any matches, so. <laughs> <laughs> the story I'm going to tell you today starts about here, when I'm four, and that takes us about, back to about 1988. So I'm going to set the scene for you here, because some of you may remember the 80s, um, some of you may not. <laughs> Some of you may remember it really well. Um, so this is a bit of a rubbish image, but you know, technology wasn't that good in the 80s, so I'm just going to let that one go. Um, so in the 80s, it was quite a fun time. And I'm going to set the scene for you here. So Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady, uh, she became the longest serving prime minister in 1988. 
Um, and I just want to note that's not Margaret Thatcher. Um, and if it was, we would have had a much more fun time in the 80s, probably. Uh, the average house price was about 60k, which is ridiculous. Um, where I'm from in Bournemouth, you can't even get a beach hut for that now. Um, the O levels were replaced by the first GCSEs, um, and my mum still can't grasp this. She still thinks I have O levels for some reason. And <laughs> lastly, the only way is up by Yaz and the plastic population uh, was top of the charts. Um, and I remember this playing on the radio at home uh, on the day that I got to the biggest trouble so far of my short little life um, because I was doing a bit of this on the bed. I was bouncing up and down. And again, this isn't me. <laughs> this is Macaulay Culkin, I think. Um, and I was bouncing along to it on my parents' bed. And it was a typical 80s bedroom. It was all shiny sheets, plastic, lurid pink ones, um, wood chip wallpaper on the walls. Yes. Um, that horrible, like, musty 80s smell as well that you get in 80s bedrooms. Um, and it was like a furnace. <laughs> it was like a furnace in there as well. It was so hot from me jumping on this bed for so long. Um, and the air was charged with mischief. Uh, there was the hammering sound of me bouncing up and down on that bed like a pneumatic drill. Um, but there was a reason for me bouncing on this bed. And it was because I was trying to reach my most favourite toy uh, that I'd been banned from from playing with over and over again. And I bounced and I bounced and I bounced and I managed to get my sticky little hands on my favorite toy, um, which was scissors. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately for my parents, every time I got hold of the scissors, bad things happened. Um, <laughs> so I was so excited that I got hold of them and I found them. Um, my heart was beating like a drum in my chest. And the first miracle is that I didn't stab myself, basically, because I was bouncing on a bed with these things in my hand at four years old. Um, I slid off those shiny sheets. I tiptoed down the hallway uh, with the stealth of a cat. And then I crept into the bedroom that I shared with my little sister, who was about one and a half, two at the time. And um, she was the vision of an angel. She was sat there with her lovely blonde ringlets <laughs> around her head. Um, and I decided to, you know, show her what we could do with these scissors. So first of all, I <laughs> first of all I chopped my own fringe off, um, and I remember I was throwing it around like snow. We were playing with it. I remember it tickling her with it and her giggling. And then I proceeded to chop all her hair off as well, um, and she loved it. She was fine. <laughs> Um, the next thing I know, um, my mother erupted into the room uh, like a cannon, and she was really pissed off with me, basically. She was not happy. Um, thankfully, she did calm down, eventually, because it's not like there was anything important going on the next day, like the nursery photos or anything <laughs> being taken. So, <laughs> she's going to be really unhappy with me for this. Um, that's her there. Um, my mum always points out that iron grip I've got on her there to say, you know, you're not getting away this time. Um, and... Uh, I'm looking a bit bald, um, and she's very bald because I chopped all her hair off. Um, I don't think she's traumatised because of what i done. I think it's, she's traumatised because of what my mother's made us wear there, so um, not my fault. Um, <laughs> so that wasn't a research story. Um, but imagine if it was and I'd presented it to you like this, if you were my client and I'd presented you with something that started off like this. Um, it's just much drier, isn't it? It doesn't really get across all the emotions that we felt during that story. No one goes to the cinema and says, oh, I just really hope they've done it as a flowchart this time. And then I can just get the hell out of there as quickly as possible. So no one really does that. Um, and if you do, you're kind of failing at life. I can't help you. <laughs> so my point is, after much rambling, um, that user research is just full of these rich and engaging stories that you come across. Um, and they're not always funny like that. Some are lighthearted. Um, I have done research with someone who had their top open to start with, and they didn't know. They had a bit of a, a funny moment there, and I had to tell them to do the top up. Um, the poor lady. Um, <laughs> Um, but they aren't always like this. Sometimes you come across people who are terminally ill. Um, they're going through painful separations or divorces. Um, they may have mental health issues. Um, I've come across people who've lost children. Uh, they might just be coping with their workload or the software or product that we have designed for them um, is a struggle in their everyday life and it's a pain for them. So I'm going to explain some of the techniques I used just there um, in a moment. Um, but first I want to explore why we like stories so much. Um, 
And that is because we have actually used them for thousands of years. Um, we've been around for a long time. And actually, it's the discovery of fire, or what we can do with fire, rather, that has changed the way um, we bond together and communicate as a species. So um, it extended our day, basically. So before we understood what fire could do, we kind of just went to bed, and that was it. But as soon as we discovered fire, we sat around doing things like this. Um, so this is the Kalahari Bushman here in um, the Namibia desert. And social anthropologists have studied uh, this tribe for a little while. And what they noticed is that during the day, only about 6% of their conversations are based on stories, um, as we know them. Uh, the rest of the time, they're talking about purely functional things, like where is the food, which direction should we travel in, um, what predators are nearby. And then what they noticed is during the evening, when they're sat around like this, is about 81% of their time, they're telling stories to one another. Um, and these are things like rituals and celebrations they're looking forward to. Uh, they're telling jokes, they're gossiping together, um, they're passing on safety information, and they're just telling these imaginative stories to one another. They're entertaining one another. Um, so these stories are kind of like the social glue, and it binds people together in groups. And um, our society is kind of built on being able to tell these stories to one another. And as such, we've kind of evolved to respond to them really well. Um, so if you look at the cave painting up there, um, this is sort of one early way of telling stories to one another. And if you look at what I'm doing right now, is this so different? This is like the first ever PowerPoint up here. And we haven't really changed much as a species in that way. Um, and one way you can think of how it's been evolutionary beneficial to us to uh, respond well to stories um, is if I show you this. So imagine you and I are walking through this forest and we come across this bridge and you say, I want to get across that bridge to the other side. And I say, I do too. And you walk across that bridge and unfortunately you fall to a horrific death. I'm really sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I'm not going to follow you across that bridge because that would be silly. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to carry on, I'm going to find another bridge that looks safer, um, given the knowledge I already have of what an unsafe bridge looks like. Um, and then I'm going to go back and tell all my family and friends, and say I saw this, this person fall off and it was horrible, but use this bridge, it's much better. So that's how it sort of keeps us safe. Um, and this is the sort of conversations they heard, the social anthropologists heard, um, um, the Kalahari Bushmen telling each other about safety. So it's really important to understand that we um, interpret our life experiences as ongoing narratives. So everything's a story to us. So just today, this is just another page in our story coming to this conference. And uh, we sort of uh, approach things in this narrative mode and we make decisions and act within this framework as well. So it, it has a, a big effect on us. This was first proposed in 1984 and it's since been proven using advanced brain scan scanning techniques. And all this really means that you need to understand is that people relate better to stories than they do to data and statistics, like that flow chart that I showed you there. And people can't empathize with statistics um, or data or big data sets that are just raw data. Um, and it's stories that give us uh, the humanity that enable us to understand one another um, emotionally as well. So empathy is key. And uh, creating great experiences for our products and services um, need empathy. But stories are kind of both an art and a science, so some people are natural storytellers. Um, but there is a science that you can kind of leverage there as well. So there's a chap in the States called Yuri Hassan, and he's <laughs> with Princeton University. And he's done some really interesting research into neural coupling, and he calls it alignment as well. So he has a group of researchers, and they asked, how do our brains change when we talk to one another? what's happening in this sort of setting where I'm telling you stories and talking to you and you're hopefully listening? <laughs> um, and does the type of language we use um, change things? And does our native language change things? Um, and then what happens when we pass these stories on as well? And his findings were extremely interesting. So this might be a little bit um, blurred, but what he did is his, he got five listeners and he scanned their brains using an MRI scanner. And an MRI scanner works by detecting where activity is happening in the brain. So if blood is seen in a certain area, it can detect that and it knows there's activity there. So all these people, when they were just alone with their thoughts, the, the brain waves are all over the place. There's, the neural activity was just uh, incoherent, really. 
And then what they did is they put someone else in an MRI scanner and they scanned their brain while they were telling a story and looked at the similarities in the listeners' brains. And you can see that circle on the right there is where you get in this neural alignment. And this is fascinating. So the listener's brain is making these vivid mental simulations of what they're hearing. And this is really powerful. And you might see this in like the media and things like this, where you're starting to see ideas and thoughts and emotions planted in people's heads. Um, so it's kind of like mind control. And the listeners feel what the storyteller felt, like physically feel. Um, they didn't imagine it. Um, so you see this in the cinema, like if there's trouble, everyone sort of gasps in unison if there's something really bad happening, and everyone laughs if something funny happens. So, I mean, there was a film recently called A Quiet Place, and I think the, the mother was walking down the stairs, and you might remember it, there was a nail stuck up um, through one of the uh, stairs, and as her foot goes over it, everyone in the audience went <sighs> like that. And that is because your brain is physically um, creating that pain for you. You, you know what's going to happen. Uh, so they also found that these stories, they self-perpetuate. And you may notice this from things like gossip. So um, what they did is they took one of the original listeners and they scanned their brain while they told the story to a new listener. And they saw the same neural alignment happening. Um, so this is great news for us um, as people speaking to users and telling their story. Um, if we can tell a compelling story about our findings to start with, we can get other people talking about that too within our organizations or our clients' organizations. Um, and something else to note is the language used as well. So metaphor and analogy increases this neural coupling. Um, so these are things that I use, like uh, it was like a furnace in the room and uh, the, the feeling of the hair on the carpet, feeling like snow or itchy, um, the slipping on the smoothie, smooth bed sheets and getting my sticky little hands on something. So these are all metaphors that we can relate to. We have a um, reference somewhere in our mind what sticky feels like. And it just creates that sensation for us in our brain. So I know it's quite late on like Friday afternoon, but I really want to talk about this somatosensory cortex. So keep up. <laughs> so this is the part in the brain that is helping you create those sensations. So it's uh, to do with things like pressure, pain, warmth, and texture. So if I say to you, uh, a man had leathery hands, you have a reference somewhere in your brain to what leather feels like, or cracked leather maybe, and your brain actually makes you feel that sensation. Um, also, you can appeal to something called the primary olfactory cortex. And I talked about this uh, being the musty room that smelled, and that actually recreates that smell for you in your brain. Um, some Spanish researchers in 2006 uh, published their findings on using words like cinnamon and coffee um, and perfume, it actually activates that area in your brain that you think you're smelling those things. Um, so it's quite crazy, really. And I cheated there. I showed you a picture of a coffee cup because we're actually really, um, uh, we're really responsive to images as well. So we have this um, Olympian skill of being able to uh, remember an image that we've seen for less than a second for decades. And that's not the same case with something like a paragraph of text. So using images is really powerful for us too while we're telling stories because it helps us with recall and recognition. So we can do this now. And what I want you to do is all close your eyes for a second. And don't worry, I have no matches or scissors. <laughs> <laughs> so I want you to imagine that you are looking at the majestic Eiffel Tower. OK, so it's very subtle, but a couple of you did move your neck up a little bit there, move your head up to look upwards because you're imagining something big. Um, and now I want you to imagine that you have an ice cold glass of raw lemon juice in front of you and you're going to take a really long gulp of that. Now I don't know about you but my mouth is already starting to water and this is a proven study that's been done um, that just thinking about that causes your body to have this physiological reaction. Um, so now I want you to think of some words that begin with the letter P or B. So it's so subtle that I won't be able to see it, but subconsciously, you may not even know you're doing this, but you're creating those shapes with your lips um, to, to sort of really bring that alive for yourself. So this is kind of like a superpower. You can all open your eyes now. <laughs> um, and it's really powerful when you're telling a story to sort of appeal to these regions of the brain that are to do with senses and you know, all the touch and the smell. 
And it's all really good, but how can this be used um, to create experiences and communicate experiences? Um, well, I've come across some techniques that I've used throughout my career, and they're really simple, and it really helps to create these stories. So I find the themes. So all stories have themes, and traditional stories have themes like love and lust and revenge. And if you're working on any projects like that, that sounds really exciting. Um, I'd love to speak to you. Uh, but those are probably not applicable for most people uh, working in UX or development at the moment. So you may have ones like self-discovery, growth, frustration, or connection. And you can see in this one behind me here that I was mapping out some uh, themes of communicating and, and getting people to connect with one another in an organization a bit more. And once you've got your themes, um, you may need your characters, your heroes or villains, or your bit parts. Um, in my story, I was a bit of an anti-hero, but that kind of works because we can all identify with being that naughty child that wants to just get one over your parents. Um, so yeah, don't forget your characters, and um, it's really useful to just map out all of them. So we often just stick with one, um, but there are a lot of other people, uh, other actors in their lives as well. Um, I create something called story beats um, to sort of rearrange the story around. And these are the key moments in a story um, that you'll, you'll find are really sort of important to map out. Um, so we can look at Finding Nemo, for example, to, to show this. And the, the beats go like this at the start of Finding Nemo. So you meet Marlin and Coral and their eggs. And then the family and the eggs are attacked by a barracuda. And Coral and all the eggs but one are eaten. Uh, Marlin names the last egg Nemo, and the rest is kind of history. Um, but this wasn't the way this film was supposed to go. I think it was supposed to be that the Barracuda came last, um, and, uh, you know, it just didn't really work. So they switched it around using story beats, and they found that um, it worked better. So it can help you sort of map out these stories. And then once you've got that, you can plot your stories. Um, so you can have this dramatic arc. Um, and you can sort of plot your characters along them as well. Um, I mean, what happens in their story? And it might be more of an anecdote. So is it the tale of an administrator that comes into work expecting an easy day, and then the software doesn't work properly? Um, do they lose their work? Um, how do they triumph? Um, who helps them? How are they transformed along this journey? Um, so there are only a handful of plots that exist that can sort of guide you throughout this, and they can give more impact to the stories you're telling about your research. Um, so one of them is the hero's journey, and you'll recognize this from major films and books um, like Lord of the Rings, for example. So you'll get Frodo comfortable in the Shire, um, and he has the supernatural aid of the ring. He has a mentor in Gandalf, and he has a helper in Samwise Gamgee, I think it is. And he has all these challenges and temptations that he has to come up against. And then finally, he's transformed when he gets rid of the ring, and he returns back to the Shire, um, uh, as a hero, he's changed, he's transformed. And you kind of want to, you know, relay your stories like this, following these sort of guidelines. And you'll see these in things like The Matrix and Star Wars and Harry Potter. Um, it's a very common thing to have this hero transformed. And I love to talk about this. This is just basically adding a twist to the story as well. So um, we love this. It's called canon and breach technique as well, if you write novels. And it's... A story is just a sequence of events, and it can really help to have these twists to keep people interested. Um, and perhaps you didn't expect to come here today and find out uh, about my feral childhood, really. Um, but, you know, it just turns your expectations on, on its head, and it can really help. We've already talked about using the right language, um, so bringing the story alive with things like metaphors and an analogies and similes, um, uh, just activating all the different parts of the brain there to bring this neural coupling into into effect. And I always find that presenting your story in situ really helps as well. So if, you ha if you're working on an app, um, instead of just sending a prototype around in the email or pinning it up on the wall, um, taking screenshots and emailing them, um, it's actually better to just show it in situ. So real people using um, the real app, um, maybe here like in a car park, finding their car where, you know, using the app that you've developed. It's always you know, uh, way more interesting to see that. And then tell your story face to face because there's so many benefits to that. It's just more credible and it's more trustworthy. Um, and it builds rapport with the people you're telling the story to to be more believable. Um, and you've got all those nice visual cues that you don't normally get if you're just emailing some of your work across or a report. 
And this is my favorite one, so mood contagion. This is a phenomenon that you get where people transfer their moods to one another. Um, and if you can tell a passionate story about your user research um, or the passion of your mission comes across in your user experience that you're giving people, um, they're going to transfer that to everyone they touch. Um, and it can make your users feel a stronger sense of connection to your product or your service. So let's see if you can spot any of the techniques that I've just talked about just now. So I want to talk about someone called Emma that I met during some research a few years ago. And I've changed her name because it's a particularly sensitive story. Um, so I worked with a business um, several years ago who were trying to empower independent businesses, um, trying to give them some traction on the high street um, over the usual chains and the homogenous high streets that we have. Um, so Emma was a local businesswoman and I'd arranged to meet her to do some research with her. And she'd given me quite a strange time, of something like half past seven in the morning to go and meet her. And I thought, that's fine. It's probably just because she just wants to crack on with her day. She doesn't want me hanging around asking her questions while she's trying to do her job. Um, so it was quite a mild morning and it was still a little bit dark. And as, as I approached her business, I could see that she was sat inside her business through the glass front in a pool of light. Um, and I pushed the door open and a wall of heat hit me. And I thought, this is quite strange. Um, but I'll, I'll go with it because it was just a mild morning. And then I noticed that Emma was cocooned in a blanket and she had a hat on, a woolly hat. And I thought that was even more strange. But I didn't really know Emma, so I thought, I'm not going to ask just yet. So after about 30 minutes of chatting with Emma, um, I said, I have to ask, why is it so hot in here? Because <laughs> I'm melting and you're clearly wrapped in a blanket. And I wasn't really expecting the answer she gave me, but she said, well, I've been having chemotherapy and I'm feeling really ill and it's just making me really cold. So, you know, I have to wrap up. And I said, oh, I'm really sorry. Um, and we chatted a bit more and the conversation moved on. Um, and it turned to me saying, um, I hope you're getting enough rest in between your chemotherapy. Are you managing, managing to get someone to help run your business because we were chatting about how independent businesses run. And this bit I really wasn't prepared for. And she said, um, I've never worked so much in my life since I was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, and I said, why is that? You know, and she says, I'm working all the hours in the day because I have a two-year-old son and I could die in a few months and I have to leave something for him. I can't have him end up in something like care or being passed around. So I have to leave as much money as I can. And if anyone's a parent in the, in the audience, that's really quite a powerful story. It really, you know, even if you're just a human being, um, you know, it really gets you here. And it, it got me, <laughs> it really uh, affected me. And it's quite a visceral story. But only I was there. It was just me and Emma in that room. And it would be so easy to take back that story and uh, just merge it into a persona, uh, merge it into a report, you know, stick it on the wall and just gloss over it. And actually, it was way more important to take that story back and tell it as a proper story. Um, because they're not just a frivolous activity, telling these stories. Um, you don't just tell them for the sake of it. Um, they give your stakeholders this framework to empathize with people like Emma. Um, and then it gives them the respect that they deserve as people. Um, and it can often be the catalyst for stakeholders to then go and make decisions accordingly with people like Emma in mind. <coughs> So Emma's story ended really well. I kept in contact, and she's well and healthy again. And that's great. She was really on a hero's journey. Um, she was conquering light over darkness. You know, She was slaying the monster that is cancer. Um, and she had all these challenges as well, if you remember that cycle. Um, she had the chemo. She had childcare um, issues running the uh, business that she had and thinking about the future if she wasn't going to be here for her child. Um, and she then returned to normal life, and she was changed, but she was stronger because of it. So that was a really interesting story to take back, and it really changed the way that we uh, moved that business ahead. Um, so in my case, let's go back to what happened after my nursery photo fiasco, um, because there's more, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so that afternoon, we were sat in the living room, and I was just keeping a low profile obviously. Um, my sister was sat a really, really safe distance away from me um, because she was a bit nervous, I, I guess. Uh, and I was just playing on the carpet and I could smell the roast dinner um, that my mum was cooking in the kitchen and she was crashing around in there like an angry bear because she was still really annoyed with me. <laughs> um, 
And then came this frantic knocking on the door. Um, someone was hammering on there and they really wanted to speak to my mother. Um, so I knew I was about to get into more trouble. So I did the only thing a four-year-old can is then I hid. Um, I just dove underneath the dining room table and hid there and thought no one would find me. Um, I heard uh, the door open and then the floor started shaking like an earthquake and I was dragged out by the waist of my pants like a naughty dog. <laughs> and I came face to face um, with the neighbor's child. Um, now this isn't actually him because it was the 80s and I didn't have a digital camera and I was only four. Um, but I'd done something similar to him, so... <laughs> so what I'd done is I'd followed my mum, uh, found where she'd hid the scissors, and then I had snuck out of the house and beckoned the neighbour's child uh, to, come <laughs> to come near the fence. And he consented to this. Um, he actually wanted this, so I'm not taking the blame for this one. Um, anyway, he moved shortly after that. I don't know what, what happened there, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> And incidentally, I'm actually a parent now myself. And after I wrote this talk, or whilst I was writing this talk, um, my five-year-old had a parents' evening. And it was all going really well. And they told me that he's doing really, really well, exactly where they expect him to be. And just as we were about to leave, and they said, and he's got absolutely amazing scissor skills. <laughs> and my <laughs> husband's face just went white. And I was like, it's nothing to do with me. <laughs> So if there's one thing I want you to take away um, today, it's that uh, telling a story gives people this simulation and instructions and the energy that they need to act. Um, we still need our deliverables, so I'm not saying we don't need our flowcharts and our personas and our reports and wireframes and prototypes. We need those. Um, they're really useful. They have a purpose. Um, but narratives and story, they're sort of this golden thread that sort of ties everything together um, so that we can understand um, these people and we can relate to them as human beings. Um, so use the neuroscience of neural coupling. Um, it activates those regions of the brain um, and your stakeholders will experience the same visceral stories that you experienced as a researcher as well. Okay, so I hope that's been useful in some way for you, so thank you for listening. Thank you.